for her husband. And you are there when her husband takes his last breath. And she turns to you and she says, is he gone? Those are the most important moments of being a deacon, the great grace that we have to be in people's lives. So just that quick walk through the Holy Family, we can see that the Holy Family very much mirrors our family life today. In fact, they endured more than many of our families will ever endure in a lifetime. So they can very much serve as a model, as a witness for our family life today. Whether that family life is with a husband, wife, and children, or whether that family life is a priest who's the father in a parish family, or the rector who's the father of this seminary family, or the beautiful sisters who represent the church, who represent also the Blessed Mother, right, who's the mother of the church and the work that they do to give life to so many of the young people, so many of the poor, so many in hospitals, representing the children. Beautiful. This is our family. Now, I have four beautiful children, including a set of twins. And I remember that shortly after, because when the twins were born, we had a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and newborn twins. Life was crazy in our house. In fact, if we didn't take video, I would not remember the entire first year of the twins' lives. It's a blur. But I remember spending one of my many sleepless nights thinking about how my life has changed since the day I met my wife. How I abandoned the thought of becoming a Benedictine. I actually was a Benedictine for a while. And uh, since we have so many vocations, people vocations, I want to talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit later. How I moved across the country, I grew up in New Jersey, which is on the east coast of the United States, but my wife is from Oregon on the west coast of the United States. So I had to move from one side of the country to the other one, living in a place that I never thought I would live in my whole life. How entering into a lifelong commitment of loving communion and intimacy has changed my relationship with God. Not really having an appreciation for how four young children can all at the same time exhaust me to the point of numbness. <laughs> Made me mad enough to pull out what little hair I have left. That's why I'm bald, by the way. <laughs> Made me laugh until I cry. And fill me with so much love and joy that I can barely keep my heart in my chest. My life has not just changed since the day I met my wife. My life has truly been transfigured. It's been transformed. I've gone from living for myself to dying to myself in loving sacrifice and service to my wife and to my children. Now, I'm going to talk about fathers in the next talk. So I'm going to spend this time talking about the roles of mothers in the family. I'm going to talk about fathers next. I'm going to talk about the role of mothers now. And it's very interesting. You know, one, thing I want to, one quick thing I want to say about this relationship of, of marriage. One of the things I do in my parish is I do marriage preparation. I help couples prepare for marriage. And it's very interesting, that very first meeting. You're sitting there, and they're so excited, and you're excited, you're happy for them, and you tell them how you make your wife, and everybody's happy. And so I ask what I think is a very simple question. Why are you getting married? And they say, well, we're in love. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs>
if you're basing your marriage on a crossword puzzle, <laughs> see, they, they often they can't give you the answer. What is the answer, by the way? I tell them, so the reason why you're here is you believe with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul that the person sitting next to you is the person that God has placed in your life to help you get to heaven. That's why you're here. They go, oh, oh. See, they're so, they're so worried about the cake and the musicians and all the, that they don't stop to think that they're establishing a lifelong commitment of love and, commun and communion and intimacy together. See, our parish, we help them to prepare to receive a sacrament of the Holy Catholic Church and not look good for pictures. Because we have a responsibility to make sure that that couple is a And sometimes, after our preparation, the couples decide not to get married. And that's a good thing. Better it happen now, than you forget until you, after you're married, and it comes up later. But I want to talk about moms. And the way I want to talk about this, I talk a little bit personally here, is about my own mom. Now, because of the situation with my dad, uh, my dad loved three things in life. <laughs> Womenizing, alcohol, and cigarettes. My father slept around with many women. He had 15 other children besides the four of us with my mother that we know of. There's probably more. <laughs> the last one, number 15, made his presence known to me on Facebook during Lent of last year. And so when he told me, hi, how are your brother? I'm like, oh, no. So I emailed my siblings and, uh, you know, the, the, my two brothers and my sister, and they said, another one? <laughs> <laughs> my father drank. And if you come from a household where someone drinks, I don't even have to tell you of the insanity that goes on in a household like that. The embarrassing moments over and over again. My father never went to church, never saw my father in church, nothing. So my mother truly became a source of spiritual strength and love for me. We were very, very close. The reason I left the monastery was not that I was having a good time, I actually liked it. <laughs> But my mother had a massive heart attack and almost died. I'm the oldest. At that time, my sister was still in high school. And my brothers in the middle were not in a position of being responsible. So I, just as I've always done since I was 12 years old, took responsibility for being the father, quote unquote, father of my family. So I left the monastery on leave to take care of my mother, and my sister, make sure my sister ate and got to school on time and did her homework and all that. So I ran the house. When I was out of the monastery, I went to a wedding of some university friends of mine. And I ended up meeting the woman who would end up being my wife. So I didn't go back to the monastery and all that. But, <laughs> but I'll tell you this. The experience with the Benedictines gave me a very strong foundation for my faith, along with my mother. But praise the Lord Jesus Christ for my mother, most saintly woman I've ever, and the strongest woman I've ever known in my life is my mom. Thanks be to God for her. And the Benedictus gave me a strong foundation, a love for the Mass, a love for Eucharist, a love for adoration, a love for devotions like the Rosary. All of that was fostered in the monastery. So even though I'm not a monk, I am grateful for that experience because that experience laid a strong foundation for the work that I'm doing right now for the Lord. So I'm grateful for that. Now, after my mother recovered, she never really fully recovered, and that started a 20-year decline in her health. She lived with, we moved her out to Oregon, and she lived with us the last three years of her life. She lived in our house with my wife and my family. It's a great privilege. My mother spent her first part of her life 
taking care of us when we were little, so now I'm going to take care of her. I'm not going to put her in a home. I'm going to take care of my mother. So she lived with us. And I remember the weekend that I left. And just like I always do, I kiss my mom, I love you, i see you when I get back. I went to speak at a men's conference in Texas, and then I flew to EWTN to film the series number three, my third series for EWTN. So I'm having dinner on Sunday night with the producer and his wife, and we're talking about the shoot the next day, what we're going to film the next day at EWTN. And my cell phone, my mobile rings. And it's a doctor, physician at the emergency room at a hospital. He said that my mother had a massive heart attack, she's in a coma, and they don't expect her to live. So I started calling my, my brothers and my sister, and by the time they brought the food out, I got another call from the hospital that said she died. So the folks at EWTN were great. They canceled the shoot. They put me on a schedule to put me on a plane the next day to come home. Uh, Father Mitch Pacwa, who's my scripture professor in graduate school, uh, I went to his house. He knew my mom because he taught me in graduate school and he knew my family. Um, and so he allowed me to spend a few hours with him just grieving and processing the whole loss of my mother. Father Wade Benisa said mass for my mom the next day at EW10 and I flew home. And I was holding it together pretty well, all the funeral arrangements and everything. And my mom would always say, I want you to preach at my funeral, son. I said, yes, mommy, I'm going to preach at your funeral. No, son, when the time comes, I want you to do the holiday at my funeral. Mommy, I'm going to preach at your funeral. Okay, right? So finally, I, had, I really had to do it. Now, when I used to bring my mom to church, she was permanently disabled by that point. She was in a wheelchair, and she had a portable oxygen tank. You know, she had the, the tubes in her nose that the oxygen helped her breathe. And she always sat in the front pew on the left. That was her seat. If anybody else sat there, get up! That's the deacon's mother's seat, get up! Right? <laughs> so my mom and I had this little thing. Whenever I got up to read the gospel, I get up to the ammo to read the gospel. While they're singing hallelujah, I look down at my mom. My mom will look up at me. We make a little mother-son eye contact, a little connection before I read the gospel. So now it's her funeral. And I get up to read the gospel. And just out of sheer habit, I look down. My mom wasn't there. And I looked over at the casket. And I realized, she'll never be there again. And I literally slumped over in the ammo and started to cry uncontrollably. So the Ali is done, and I, I'm, I'm crying. My brother, who's a year younger than me, gets up. He comes up. He puts his arm around me. He says, hey, man, we need you. When we were kids, you were always there for us. We need you to be strong for us now. And he went and sat down. So I said a quick Hail Mary. I composed myself. I read the gospel. I preached the homily. And I buried my mother. For months after she died, every time I walked into her room, I would cry. Every time. It still smelled like her. All her stuff was still there. It, it felt like she would be coming back any minute now. And I knew that wasn't the case. What changed was when the reading came around. The gospel of the presentation of the Lord. It was like I heard that gospel for the first time. Right? Where Simeon says that the blessed mother, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many, and a sign him spoken against, and a sword shall pierce your own soul, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be laid there. And I thought to myself, wait a minute. Mary understands what I'm going through. 
It's not a matter of just losing somebody you love. I lost somebody I was physically part of. I came out of my mother. Jesus came out of his mother. Mary understands what it's like to lose somebody like that. So I said to myself, what if I laid my broken and bruised heart and laid my heart within the pierced soul of the Blessed Virgin Mary? And guess where I began to do that? Eucharistic adoration. Let me explain something to you right now. Eucharistic adoration is an absolute game changer in your life. Eucharistic adoration will change everything for you. No doubt in my mind. I was already going to adoration, but now I was going with the intention of laying my heart within the pure soul of the Blessed Virgin Mary. I remember looking at the monstrance, thinking about my mother, and I'll never, I looked at the monstrance and I said, wait a minute, Mary was the first monstrance. The Blessed Virgin Mary was the first monstrance, the first tabernacle that held the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus. And I was looking at the monsters, I was thinking, the Ark of the Covenant and Mary as the new Ark of the Covenant. Because you remember from Exodus 25 and Exodus 16 and Numbers chapter 7, what did the Ark, the old Ark of the Covenant hold within it? Three things. The Ten Commandments. The staff of Aaron and the manna from heaven. Mary, as the new Ark of the Covenant, what did she hold within her? First of all, let's look at the Ten Commandments. Didn't John say in the prologue of his gospel, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us? And he gave us a summary of the Ten Commandments. Love God, one through three, Love your neighbor as yourself, 4 through 10. The matter from heaven. Jesus said, I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Your fathers ate the manna in the desert, and they died. But he who eats this bread will live forever, because the bread that I give you is my flesh for the life of the world. And then the staff of Aaron, representing his authority as the shepherd, didn't Jesus say, I am the good shepherd? When Mary went to visit her kinswoman Elizabeth, that was the first Eucharistic procession. When the monstrance walked into the home of Elizabeth, Mary greeted her. And Elizabeth tells us, that when the greeting reached her ears, John the Baptist, her child, did what? He leapt in her womb. Aww. <laughs> now some